Chapter 28 The Religious Liberty of Vatican II Part 1 According to Vatican II, the human person would have the right in the name of his dignity not to be impeded from exercising his religious worship, whatever it might be, in private or in public, unless this troubles the public tranquility and morality. You will acknowledge that the public morality of the pluralist state promoted by the Council is not by nature going to cramp this liberty a great deal, any more than the advanced rotting of liberal society would limit the right to the liberty of partnership, if it were proclaimed in an indistinct way by the couples who are living together unwed, all in the name of their human dignity. Thus you, Muslims, pray undisturbed in the very midst of our Christian streets. You build your mosques and your minarets beside the steeples of our churches. The Church of Vatican II assures you that no one should hinder you from this, and the same goes for the Buddhists and the Hindus. In return for this, we Catholics will ask you for religious freedom in your countries, in the name of the liberty that we grant you in ours. We will also be able to defend our religious rights in the face of the communist regimes, in the name of a principle declared by so dignified a religious assembly, and already recognized by the UN and Freemasonry. This is, moreover, the consideration that Pope John Paul II made to me on the occasion of the audience that he granted me on November 18, 1978. You know, he said to me, religious liberty has been very useful for us in Poland against communism. I wanted to respond to him, very useful perhaps as an argument ad hominem, since the communist regimes have the freedom of worship inscribed in their constitutions, but not as a doctrinal principle of the Catholic Church. This is, at all events, what Father Garrigou Lagrange answered in advance. We can make of the liberty of worship an argument ad hominem against those who, while proclaiming the liberty of worship, persecute the Church, such as secularizing and socializing states, or impede its worship directly or indirectly, such as communist states or Islamic ones. This argument ad hominem is fair, and the Church does not disdain it, using it to defend effectively the right of its own liberty. It does not follow that the freedom of cults, considered in itself, is maintainable for Catholics as a principle, because it is in itself absurd and impious. Indeed, truth and error cannot have the same rights. I would like to repeat this. Only truth has rights. Error has no rights. This is the teaching of the Church. Leo XIII writes, A right is a moral faculty, and as we have said and as it cannot be repeated too often, it would be absurd to believe that it belongs naturally and without distinction or discernment to the truth and to the untruth, to the good and to the bad. The truth is, the good has the right to be propagated in the state with prudent liberty, in order that a greater number profits by it. But the untrue doctrines, the most fatal pestilence of all for the mind, it is just that the public authority uses its solicitude to repress them, in order to prevent the evil from spreading out for the ruin of society. End quote. It is clear in light of this that the doctrines and the cults of the erroneous religions have of themselves no right to be allowed to express themselves and propagate themselves freely. In order to evade this tautology, it was objected at the Council that both truth and error, properly speaking, have no rights. It is persons who have rights, who are subjects of rights. From there, they tried to dodge the problem by posing it on a purely subjective level, and thus hoping to be able to leave the truth out of account. This attempt was to be in vain, as I am now going to show you, 
by placing myself into the very problem of the counsel. Put onto the subjective level of the subject of rights, religious liberty is the same right granted to those who adhere to religious truth and those who are in error. Is such a right conceivable? Upon what does the counsel base this judgment? At the start of the council, some people wanted to found religious liberty on the rights of conscience. They wrote, Religious liberty would be fruitless if men could not make the imperatives of their conscience pass over into exterior and public acts, proclaim Bishop de Smet in his introductory speech. The argument was the following. Everyone has the duty to follow his conscience, because this is for everyone the immediate rule of action. Now this holds not only for a true conscience, but also for an invincibly erroneous conscience. In particular, those of the numerous followers of the false religions. Thus, these people have the duty to follow their conscience, and therefore they must be left free to follow it and to carry on their worship. The foolishness of this reasoning was quickly discovered, and they had to resign themselves to making a fire with other kindling. Indeed, invincible error, that is, inculpable error, certainly excuses from all moral fault, but it does not make the action good. Consequently, it does not give any rights to its perpetrator. A right can be based only on the objective norm of the law, and in the first place on the divine law, which regulates in particular the manner in which God wants to be honored by men. Since conscience did not furnish a sufficiently objective foundation, they thought they could find one in the dignity of the human person. The Council of the Vatican declares that the right to religious liberty has its basis in the very dignity of the human person. This dignity consists in the fact that man, gifted with intelligence and free will, is ordained by his nature to know God which he cannot do if he is not left free. The argument is this. Man is free. Therefore, he must be left free. Or again, man is endowed with free will. Therefore, he has the right to freedom of action. You recognize the absurd principle of all liberalism, as Cardinal Bio calls it. It is a sophism. Free will is located in the domain of being. Moral liberty and the liberty of action stem from the realm of acting. It is one thing what a man is by his nature, and it is something else what he becomes, good or bad, in the truth or in error, by his actions. The radical human dignity is indeed that of an intelligent nature, capable, therefore, of personal choice, but his final dignity consists in adhering in act, to the true and to the good. It is this final dignity which merits for each one the moral liberty, that is, the faculty of acting, and the liberty of action, which is the faculty of not being impeded from acting. To the extent in which man adheres to error or attaches himself to evil, he loses his final dignity or does not attain it and nothing more can be founded upon it. This is what Leo XIII magnificently taught in two texts hidden from view by Vatican II. Speaking of the false modern liberties, Leo XIII writes in Immortale Dei, If the intelligence adheres to false ideas, and if the will chooses evil and attaches itself to it, Neither the one nor the other reaches its perfection. Both of them fall short of their inborn dignity and become corrupt. It is therefore not permitted to bring to light and to expose to the eyes of men that which is contrary to virtue and to truth. And even less still 
to place this license under the tutelage of the protection of the laws. End quote. In the encyclical Libertas, the same Pope specifies what true religious liberty consists in and upon what it must be founded. Leo XIII writes, Another liberty that is also very loudly proclaimed is that which is named liberty of conscience. If it is understood by this that everyone can indifferently, at his pleasure, render worship to God or not, the arguments which have been given above suffice to refute this. It can be understood also in the sense that man has in the state the right to follow, according to the consciousness of his duty, the will of God, and to fulfill his precepts without anyone's being able to impede him from this. This liberty, the true liberty worthy of the children of God, which so gloriously protects the dignity of the human person, is above all violence and all oppression. It has always been the object of the wishes of the Church and of its particular affection. End quote. There you have it. True dignity, true religious liberty. False dignity, false religious liberty. Father Andre Vincent, who is very much interested in this question, wrote to me one day to put me on my guard. Be careful, he said to me. The Council is claiming for the followers of false religions not the affirmative right to practice their cult, but only the negative right not to be impeded in the exercise, public or private, of their worship. In short, Vatican II would have done nothing but to generalize the classic doctrine of tolerance. Indeed, when a Catholic state, for the sake of the civil peace, for the cooperation of all in the common good, or in a general way to avoid a greater evil or to procure a greater good, judges that it should tolerate the practice of this or that false worship. It can either close its eyes on this worship by a tolerance, meaning not taking any coercive measures in opposition to it, or even concede to its followers the civil right not to be disturbed in the exercise of their worship. Now, in this latter case, it is a question of a purely negative right. The popes, furthermore, do not fail to emphasize that civil tolerance does not grant any affirmative right to the dissidents, nor any right to practice their worship. For such an affirmative right can be based only on the truth of the worship that is considered. From Pius IX's letter Dum Civilis Societas of February 1, 1875, to Mr. Charles Perrin. If the circumstances require it, deviations from the rule can be tolerated when they have been introduced with a view to avoid greater evils, without, however, elevating them to the dignity of a right, seeing that there cannot be any right against the eternal laws of justice. From Leo XIII's Libertas. While conceding rights only to what is true and honorable, the Church is nevertheless not opposed to the tolerance that the public authorities believe that they should make use of with regard to certain things contrary to truth and justice. Consequently, with a view to a greater evil to be avoided or a greater good to obtain or preserve. From Pius XII's Allocution to Italian Jurists of December 6, 1953. No state, nor community of states, whatever may be their religious character, can give a positive mandate or a positive authorization to teach or to do what would be contrary to religious truth or to moral good. An essentially different question is this. In a community of states, can one, at least in determined circumstances, establish the norm that the free exercise of a belief or of a religious practice in effect in a member state not be impeded throughout all the territory of the community by means of coercive laws or ordinances of the state. End quote. The Pope answers this question affirmatively, yes, in certain circumstances, such a norm can be established. Father Boucher sums up this doctrine in an excellent manner. 
He writes, In decreeing tolerance, the legislator is supposed to intend to create for the profit of the dissidents not the right or the moral faculty to practice their worship, but only the right not to be disturbed in the exercise of this worship. Without ever having the right to act wrongly, one can have the right not to be prevented from acting wrongly, when a just law prohibits this hindrance for sufficient motives. End quote. Father Boucher continues, The civil right to tolerance is one thing, when this is guaranteed by the law with a view to the common good of such and such a nation, under the determined circumstances. But the pretended natural and inviolable right to tolerance for all the adherents of all religions is something else, when it is by principle and therefore in every circumstance. End quote. The civil right to tolerance, even if the circumstances that justify it seem to be multiplying today, remains nonetheless strictly relative to these circumstances. As Leo XIII writes, the toleration of evil belonging to the principles of political prudence must be rigorously encircled within the limits required by its reason for being, that is to say, by the public welfare. This is why, if it is harmful to the public welfare, or if it is for the state the cause of a greater evil, the consequence is such that it is not permitted to make use of it, for under these conditions, the reason for being is absent. End quote. Thus, it would have been very difficult at Vatican II, relying on the acts of the previous magisterium, to proclaim a natural and universal right to tolerance. Furthermore, they carefully avoided the word tolerance, which seemed much too negative, for what is tolerated is always an evil. Contrarily, they wanted to put forward the positive values of all religions. Without invoking tolerance, the Council thus defined a simple, natural right to immunity, the right not to be disturbed in the practice of one's worship, whatever it may be. The craftiness, or at least the artful step, was obvious not being able to define a right to the exercise of every form of worship, since such a right does not exist for the erroneous cults, they strained their ingenuity to formulate a natural right to immunity alone, which would hold for all adherents of all the cults. Thus, all the, quote, religious groups, a modest term concealing the babble of religions, would naturally revel in the immunity from all restraint in their worship of the supreme divinity. They would profit also from the right not to be prevented from teaching and from manifesting their faith publicly, by word of mouth and in writing. Can a greater confusion be imagined? All the followers of all the religions, the true one as well as all the false ones, boiled down to absolutely the same base of equality, would enjoy one same natural right, under the pretext that this is only a right to immunity. Is this conceivable? It is, rather, evident that of themselves, by the mere claim of their erroneous religion, the followers of this religion do not possess any natural right to immunity. Let me illustrate this truth through a concrete example. If the longing ever took hold of you to impede the public prayer of a group of Muslims on the street, or even to disturb their worship in a mosque, you would probably sin against charity and assuredly against prudence, but you would not cause any injustice to these believers. They would not be wronged in any of the goods to which they have a right, or in any of their rights to these goods. In any of their goods, for their true good is not to carry on their false worship without obstacles, but to be able one day to exercise the true worship. In any of their rights, 
because they have a right precisely to practice the worship of God in private and in public, and not to be impeded from this. The cult of Allah is not the worship of God. Indeed, God Himself has revealed the worship by which He wants to be honored exclusively, which is the worship of the Catholic religion. If, therefore, in natural justice, one does not do any wrong to these believers in any way by disturbing or preventing their worship, the reason is that they do not have any natural right not to be disturbed in the exercise of it. It will be objected here that I am negative, that I know not how to consider the positive values of the erroneous forms of worship. I have responded to this allegation by speaking to you above about searching. It will be retorted to me then that the basic orientation of the souls of the followers of the false cults remains upright and that it should be respected, and likewise the cult in which it is involved should also be respected. I could not be opposed to the cult without shattering these souls, without breaking their orientation towards God. Thus, because of its religious error, the soul in question indeed does not have the right to practice its worship. But from the fact that it is notwithstanding, I would say, connected with God from that claim, it would have a right to immunity in the exercise of its worship. Every man would have thus a natural right to civil immunity in religious matters. Let us admit for the moment this alleged naturally direct orientation of every soul towards God in the practice of its worship. It is not at all obvious that the duty of respecting its worship for that reason is a duty of natural justice. It seems to me, rather, that it is a question of a pure duty of charity. If this is the way it is, this duty of charity does not grant to the adherents of the false cults any natural right to immunity, but prompts the civil authorities to grant them a civil right to immunity. Now, the council proclaims for every man, without proving anything, precisely a natural right to civil immunity. It appears to me that, on the contrary, the practice of the false cults cannot exceed the status of a simple civil right to immunity, which is a completely different thing. Let us carefully distinguish on the one hand, the virtue of justice, which, by assigning their duties to some, give to others the corresponding right, the power to demand, and on the other hand, the virtue of charity, which indeed imposes duties on to some, without, however, assigning any right to the others. The Council invokes, beyond the fundamental dignity of the human person, man's natural quest for the divine. Each man, in the exercise of his religion, whatever it may be, would be in fact oriented towards the true God, even in an unconscious search for the true God, rooted in God, if you will. And by this claim, he would have a natural right to be respected in the practice of his worship. If a Buddhist, therefore, burns sticks of incense before the idol of Buddha, according to Catholic theology, he commits an act of idolatry. But in light of the new doctrine uncovered by Vatican II, he expresses the, quote, supreme effort of a man to search for God. This religious act, therefore, has a right to be respected now. This man has a right not to be impeded from performing it. He has a right to religious liberty. Firstly, there is an obvious contradiction in affirming that all men devoted to the false cults are of themselves naturally turned towards God. An erroneous cult of itself can only turn souls away from God because it puts them onto a path which of itself does not lead to God. It can be admitted that, 
In the false religions, certain souls can be oriented towards God, but this is because they do not attach themselves to the errors of their religion. It is not through their religion that these souls turn towards God, but in spite of it. Therefore, the respect that is owed to these souls would not imply that respect is also owed to their religion. In any case, the identity and the number of such souls, which God deigns to turn towards Him by His grace, remains perfectly hidden and unknown. It is certainly not a great number. A priest who came from a country of mixed religions informed me one day of his experience of those who live in the heretical sex. He told me of his surprise to ascertain how very stubborn these persons usually are in their errors, and how little disposed to examine the remarks that a Catholic may make to them, and how little they are docile to the spirit of truth. The identity of the souls, truly oriented towards God in the other religions, thus remains the secret of God and escapes human judgment. It is therefore impossible to found any natural or civil right on this. That would be to make the juridical order of society rest upon purely hazardous, even arbitrary suppositions. And that would also be to base the social order definitively upon the subjectivity of each one, and to build a house on sand. I will add this. I have been sufficiently in contact with the religions of Africa, animism, Islam. But it can be said as much of the religion of India, Hinduism. In order to be able to affirm that the lamentable consequences of original sin are verified among their followers, in particular the blindness of the intellect and their superstitious fear. In this respect, to uphold, as Vatican II does, a naturally direct orientation of all men towards God is totally unrealistic and a purely naturalistic heresy. May God deliver us from all subjectivist and naturalist errors. They are the unmistakable mark of the liberalism which inspired the religious liberty of Vatican II. They can lead only to social chaos, to the babble of religions. <laughs>